Right, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sheldon Solomon to you. Uh, Sheldon is Professor of Social Psychology at Skidmore College in New York, an independent liberal arts college. And Sheldon's work builds on the work of Ernest Becker, whose Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, was published in 1974, the year in which he died from cancer at the age of 49. Sheldon, a recipient of several distinguished awards in the United States of America, has spent 30 years studying how we react to the threat of mortality and how much of our behavior is driven by our awareness of death. He has this year published uh, a book, The Worm at the Core, uh, which has received rave reviews. He is also the inventor of Doughboy, <laughs> which is dough filled with cheese, chicken, <laughs> and spices. <laughs> Friends, Sheldon Solomon. Thank you, Peter. Can everybody hear? Can folks hear? Back in coach, everybody hear okay? Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. and. Uh, I have to get used to this helmet thing. I feel like I should be trying to sell you all a car, um, but I, I like to move around a little bit. So um, I wish I could have been here for the entire program. It seemed to me that this was a, a wonderful several days, but uh, 24 hours ago seems like an eternity. From my perspective, I was uh, talking to a group of folks um, in New York, and then I hopped on a plane. and. Uh, here I am, a little wobbly, but definitely uh, happy to be here. Um, I noticed on the program that uh, the title of my talk is Death, Anxiety, What Does It Mean for Hospice Care? And um, I had the program yesterday before I left to come here. And I know I've seen some of you all in other venues. You all look vaguely familiar at my age. But uh, if I have had the good fortune to uh, appear before any of you before, uh, you probably heard me say that my wife, Maureen Monahan, um, is a, a palliative care hospice worker. She's been the bereavement counselor uh, for our local hospice for the last 30, oh, almost 35 years. And she was looking at the program and she's like, uh, death anxiety, what does it mean for hospice care? Uh, you don't know anything about hospice care. Um, you've spent the last 40 years of your life pretending to learn about people by sitting in your office looking at a computer screen and never interacting with them. Um, whereas the people that I work with, and you know this because of the very fine work that you do, are, are really at the front lines intersecting with humanity at the most difficult moments. And so uh, what I'd like to do today, as Peter has uh, alluded to, is to tell you a little bit about the work that I do, uh, which is to investigate how death anxiety influences human behavior writ large, and then talk a little bit about the implications of these ideas for the work that you do, and, and hope that you'll find this uh, to be of interest and value. Um, ever since people, uh, as far as we can tell, have been around, um, we've been trying to think about what it is that characterizes the essence of our humanity. And, and this is reflected uh, in the term that we often use to refer to our species, homo sapiens. Who's ever heard that term? I know you all have. And, and as you might also know, that means the wise or thoughtful people. And, and we're too tired and to debate whether or not uh, we're worthy of that designation. I have my doubts at times, but um, the point that I'd like to make is that uh, that's not the only way that people have characterized human beings uh, over the ages. There's another term that some of you may be familiar with. It's called homo ludens, and that's this idea that we're uniquely playful creatures. There's another one out there. It's called homo faber, and that's the we're tool-making creatures. There's even another one out there called homo aestheticus, the idea 
uh, that what characterizes us as human beings is that uh, we like to surround ourselves with beauty. And, and I think all of those designations are useful because they direct our attention to aspects of our humanity uh, that I think are valuable. But what I'd like to do today uh, is to add a, another contender to the conceptual table that, that in the book that we wrote, The Worm at the Core, we, we call it homo mortalis. Uh, and uh, the idea came to me when I read a short story by a Scottish um, essayist, uh, Alexander Smith, in 1857. Uh, Smith wrote that it is the knowledge that we must die uh, that makes us human. And, and then a couple of decades later, uh, 1890, uh, Masermenos, a few years, William James uh, put a biblical slant on that notion when he said death is the worm at the core of the human experience. And those of you familiar with the Bible uh, will know that this is with reference to what happened in the Garden of Eden when Eve partakes of the apple from the tree of knowledge and that brings the awareness of death into the world. And, and then, uh, as Peter mentioned, in 1974, uh, Ernest Becker, a cultural anthropologist, uh, wins the Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Denial of Death. And, and essentially what Becker did is to elaborate on that basic basic notion that it is the awareness of death and our disinclination to accept that fact that arguably underlies a considerable proportion of human activity. And what Becker did was to try and develop these ideas from both an evolutionary point of view and an existential psychodynamic point of view. So let me give you a five or 10 minute classic comic book overview uh, of how Becker thought about these things. And the, the first thing that he did was to say, uh, let's start with Charles Darwin. And I know you're all familiar uh, with Darwin to varying degrees, um, but uh, Darwin made two claims when he developed his theory of evolution by natural selection. Claim number one is that human beings share with all forms of life a basic biological predisposition towards survival, both in the service of self-preservation as well as reproduction. Or to put that very simply, living things like to stay alive. And I know you're tired and it's been a long conference, but uh, is everyone all right with that basic assertion, living things like to stay alive? I must confess in America, I can't say that uh, in most places. Just the mention of the word Darwin makes people start to quiver. All right, but I, I think we're on solid ground here. Living things like to stay alive. On the other hand, Darwin turned right around and he said, yes, but there's a lot of ways to accomplish that. The giraffe's got the long neck, the porcupine's got the quills, the eagle's got the great eyesight, uh, the dog has a great sense of smell. But what is it uh, about us that has made us such a fantastically successful form of life? And, and the point that Darwin made was that we have two things going for us. One is, is that we're highly social or gregarious creatures, and, and, and I think we can all agree that that's the case. But the other thing that Darwin alluded to and that other thinkers have since developed uh, is the idea that we're also fantastically intelligent creatures. All right, if we had more time, I would point out that intelligence is vastly overrated unless it's accompanied by other moral and aesthetic sensibilities. But be that as it may, uh, what Becker has in mind when he declares us a uniquely intelligent form of life is that as far as we can tell, only human beings, by virtue of our enlarged forebrain, which gives us the capacity to think abstractly and symbolically, are capable of imagining things that do not yet exist. And then we have the audacity to turn our dreams into reality. The example I use at Skidmore all the time because the students are aware of it, I say, oh, let's look at Leonardo da Vinci uh, drawing pictures of helicopters in his notebooks in the 1500s. Who's ever seen those things? And, and when da Vinci did that, people are like, yo, you're just crazy. And yet this is phenomenal that today we're routinely transported by what was originally denounced as the doodlings of a madman. And I hope we can agree uh, that this is really a distinguishing characteristic uh, of our species. All other forms of life have to accept the world uh, as they encounter it. Only human beings have the capacity to imagine the world uh, as they would like it to be 
and to transform it in accordance with their desires. All right, well, so what? Well, what Becker does is to travel back in time and to say, all right, hold that idea, that's Darwin, and now let's go back in time uh, oh, 20 or so years to the 1840s and think about the Danish existential philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. A few head shakes if you've heard that name. It's one of these that a lot of us have heard, very hard to read, but uh, Kierkegaard made a strikingly interesting point in the 1840s, and that is that human beings are so smart that we actually realize that we exist. Again, to be bothersome, not a trick question. Who's aware of the fact that you're here now listening to me or pretending to do so? Just a few head shakes. And what Kierkegaard points out is that in psychology today, we call this self-awareness or self-consciousness. And the point that Kierkegaard makes is that we take self-awareness and consciousness for granted because that's just the way we are. Who's ever had, uh, maybe even today, you ever wake up one day and you're walking down the hall saying, here I am walking down the hall. Has that ever happened to anybody? You ever walk down the hall saying, here I am walking down the hall thinking about that I'm walking down the hall and you can keep going if you'd like. But the, the point that Kierkegaard makes and the important one for our purposes is that it takes a ridiculously sophisticated cognitive apparatus to, in his words, render yourself the object of your own subjective inquiry. And so a rose bush is alive but doesn't necessarily know it. An armadillo is alive but doesn't necessarily know it. But you're alive and you know it. And that's the only other assumption I need you to accept. Living things like to stay alive and you're so smart that you know that you're here. And if you grant me those two assumptions, then we can keep going because what Kierkegaard does in a very tiny little book called Fear and Trembling that I always bought for my in-laws for their coffee table uh, for Christmas presents, what, what Kierkegaard said is that if you're smart enough to know that you're here and only human beings are, are completely self-conscious, then you will necessarily experience two uniquely human emotions that Kierkegaard called awe and dread, respectively. All right, so let's just spend a couple of seconds on why it's so awesome to be alive and to know it. Who's ever woken up one day just happy to be here? I hope everybody can make that claim. You didn't win a Nobel Prize. You didn't win the lottery. Your football team didn't win uh, the World Cup. You just wake up one day and it's beautiful and you get a face full of fresh air and maybe your child or pet smiles at you or the sun glances off the dew on a leaf and you're like, life is great. All right, and again, I hope we have all had the benefit uh, of experiencing those moments, which Kierkegaard points out are ultimately the things that we cherish most, just the spontaneous exuberance of wallowing in the fact that we're here. All right, on the other hand, Kierkegaard turns right around and he says, yes, it is awesome to be alive, but it's also dreadful to be alive because unless you're a baby or, or mentally impaired, if you're smart enough to know that you're here, you're also smart enough to realize that like all living things, your life is of finite duration and that you too will therefore die. I hope this is not a new realization for anyone in this particular room. But when I, I joke with the students at Skidmore, I'm like, who keeps lists of things to do? And they all raise their hand. I'm like, walk the dog change the oil in the car, pay the mobile phone bill, die. Who has that on your list of things to accomplish? And no one does, uh, because as Kierkegaard points out, this is something that we would happily defer in perpetuity if we were able to do that. But Kierkegaard keeps going, and he says, it's not only the awareness that we someday die that is psychologically discombobulating, it's also the concurrent realization that any of us can die at any time for reasons that we could never anticipate or control. Again, I know I don't have to say this to you all, given what you do each day, and just the fact that every human being knows another one who should be here uh, but isn't. Plane crash, tumor, uh, hit by an automobile, and so on and so forth. Tolstoy called that tragedy, so you know that you will someday die. Uh, you know you can die at any time, 
and then Becker, just to kind of kick us all in the psychological groin, metaphorically speaking, borrows an idea from Freud uh, and says, you know what? We also don't like the idea that we're animals. It really bothers us to admit that fact. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, who's, has anybody seen the Elephant Man film? I don't, uh, the, yeah, this is great, because people of our generation are more likely to have seen it. Uh, but remember when the Elephant Man says, I am not an animal. It's one of the most striking moments in the film. And, you know, I'm rooting for him. I'm like, go, oh, Mr. Pachyderm. I'm, I'm with you. All right, but you're wrong. Uh, you are an animal, and so too am I. Uh, whether I like it or not, I'm a breathing piece of defecating meat that from a purely biological perspective is no more significant or enduring than a lizard or a potato. And the point that Becker makes uh, is that if that was the only thing that we thought about, right, I'm going to die. I could walk out of the auditorium today and get smote by a comet. Uh, I'm a breathing piece of defecating meat. I'm a coal cut with an attitude. I'm spam with a plan, but I don't even have a can. I have a lot of those, but we don't have enough time for today. But the point is, is that uh, those realizations, uh, I am going to die, I could die, at any time, I'm a pate with panache. If that's all we thought about, we wouldn't be able to stand up in the morning. We, we'd be twitching blobs of biological protoplasm, cowering under our chairs, groping for sedatives the size of sport utility vehicles. And so the question is, how is it that we are able to stand up in the morning and to walk around with a modicum of psychological equanimity in light of the reality of the human condition. All right, what Becker proposes is that our ancestors solved the problem uh, of the potentially debilitating anxiety engendered by the uniquely human awareness of death uh, by the construction and maintenance uh, of what the anthropologists today call culture. All right, according to Becker, culture consists uh, of humanly constructed beliefs about the nature of reality uh, that we share with our fellow humans in our group uh, to give us a sense that life has meaning and, and that we have value and in so doing to minimize or eradicate death anxiety. So for Ernest Becker, meaning and value are, are very important, so let's dwell on that just for a moment. Becker points out that all cultures give us an account of the origin of the universe. All cultures give us a prescription for how we ought to behave while we're here. All cultures give us some hope of immortality, either literally through the heavens, the afterlives, the souls and reincarnations of the world's great religions, or symbolically, as the ancient Greeks pointed out, you may know that you're not gonna be here forever, but you might be comforted by the prospect that some vestige of yourself persists over time, perhaps by having children, perhaps by amassing great fortunes, uh, perhaps by doing something significant in the sciences uh, and the arts. And so the, the point that he makes is that we need to perceive that life has meaning uh, in order to function on a day-to-day -day basis. That's necessary. However, he then says it's not sufficient uh, because in addition to the belief uh, that life is meaningful, we also need to believe that we as individuals have value. All right, remember when you were a little kid, and I know for some of us it's been quite some time, but who ever dreamed of doing something great when you were a little kid? Did you ever sit around saying, oh, I'm gonna do something great, I'm gonna cure cancer, I'm gonna win an Olympic medal, I'm gonna make a whole lot of money and do something useful for humanity? Well, what Becker points out is that that's not pathological narcissism, that's the normal yearning of a self-conscious creature to want to believe that we are here for a particular and worthy purpose. And what Becker tells us is that the way culture gives us the opportunity to be of value is through the provision of social roles, each with associated standards of conduct that if you meet or exceed, uh, you can perceive yourself as a valuable person in a meaningful universe. So if you play football, your job is to score goals, except if you're the goalie, then you don't want to have goals scored on you. Uh, if you're a business person, then you want to make money. If you're a nurse, you want to help your patients get better, and so on and so forth. 
Well, that's essentially uh, what Ernest Becker says, that the uniquely human awareness of death, which is an unintended byproduct of our vast intelligence, gives rise to potentially overwhelming terror, and that terror is managed uh, by embracing a cultural worldview uh, that gives us a sense that we have value and that life has meaning, and, and therefore, whether we're aware of it or not, we spend a lot of time trying to maintain faith in our culturally constructed beliefs and, and confidence in the proposition that we're worthy individuals. All right, how am I doing so far? Is that all right so far? All right, so two questions now. So what, and, and how do we know if this is true? All right, so in the world that I inhabit uh, as an experimental social psychologist, one question that always arises about any idea is, well, so what? If it happens to be true, what does it buy us in terms of explanatory power? What can we understand that would be difficult to understand in the absence of these ideas? And then the second question is, well, how do we know if these ideas are true? Although Ernest Becker won a Pulitzer Prize for the denial of death, uh, he was basically denounced and ignored uh, as an academic uh, in the U.S. and in Canada. People just said, this is speculative nonsense. Or, it's interesting poetry, uh, but it, it, there's no evidence for it, A. And B, it would be impossible to provide evidence for it. All right, so that's what I've been doing, as Peter mentioned, with my colleagues for almost 35 years, Jeff Greenberg at the University of Arizona and Tom Pazinski at the University of Colorado. Uh, we've been doing experiments that uh, we believe has generated an impressive body of evidence in support uh, of the ideas that I have just presented. So what I want to do is to kind of glob those together and talk about some things that different areas of human behavior uh, that I think can only be understood uh, in light of Becker's ideas. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the studies that we've done so you can just get a sense of, of how we've generated evidence for these notions. All right, our original interest in Becker's work was because we were trying to figure out uh, human beings' uh, annoying inability to get along with other human beings who don't share their beliefs uh, about the nature of reality. Was it Robert Burns who, who coined the term man's inhumanity to man? I, I think it was, but uh, that, that's what we were originally trying to find out, is how come uh, we can't get along with people uh, that, that worship different gods, that salute different flags, that wear different kinds of clothes. And by the way, this is not a recent phenomenon. So ever since people have been around, uh, history, one way of thinking about it, and it's not a very flattering depiction, is that it's just been one ongoing succession of genocidal atrocities uh, juxtaposed with the brutal subjugation of designated in-house inferiors. Why do we do that? All right, well, for Becker, uh, he has a lot of reasons, but let's just do one, and it's the most obvious one, and it is that if your beliefs about the nature of reality serve to minimize death anxiety, then whenever you run into somebody with different beliefs, uh, you have a problem, whether you're aware of it or not. Because if you accept the validity of alternative conceptions of reality, you necessarily undermine the confidence with which you subscribe to your own. So who's familiar, I know you all are, with the Judeo-Christian account of the origin of the universe where the Lord created the heavens and earth in six days uh, and so on. But that's not the only uh, beautiful cosmology story. Uh, the Fulane in Africa believed that the earth was created out of a giant drop of milk. I put if the milk story is right, well, then my story is wrong. And so the point for Becker is that we're always going to have problems accepting other people who are different, and that what we will tend to do is to denigrate them as inferior forms of life, not quite worthy of the designation of humans, 
We try and convince people who are different to dispose of their ideas and to adopt ours instead. Christian missionaries have been quite good at that, but they're not the only proselytizers on the planet. And if that doesn't work, just kill those people, uh, thus proving that your ideas and your God are superior after all. All right, so now the question is, how do we know? if what I just said has any merit. Well, Jeff and Tom and I, 35 years ago, uh, we had an idea, uh, and it was a very simple one. We just said, okay, if these ideas are, quote, true, then what would happen if we brought people into the lab and we asked them to think about themselves dying, to just uh, literally fill out a little questionnaire where we say, please describe your thoughts and feelings about your own mortality. And then in a control condition, uh, we would ask people to describe their thoughts and feelings about something very unpleasant but not fatal. Uh, you're in a car accident and you have to lop off a limb. Uh, you need a root canal and the dentist has run out of anesthetic. Uh, you vomit in the front of an audience giving a big talk and people are not overly enthused or so on and so forth. And what we reasoned is that if Becker is right, then when you're reminded of your mortality, that should make you embrace your beliefs even more and we should be able to detect that uh, by measuring your reactions to people who are similar to you or people who are opposed to your beliefs or merely different. So what we predicted is that when you're reminded of death, you're going to love other people who share your beliefs, and you're going to hate and even harm other folks who are different. Head shakes if that makes sense, because everything else is going to be easy if that's okay. And so we've done, there's literally more than a thousand of these studies, and we've done about half of them. And sometimes we do them in the lab, sometimes we do them outdoors. We stop people either in front of a funeral parlor or a hundred meters to either side, and our thought is that when you're stopped in front of a funeral parlor, that's going to remind you of your mortality. And then one other thing that we do, and this is really, I believe, important, at least as an experimentalist, in other situations, we bring people into the lab and we ask them to read something on a computer, uh, but what they don't know is that while they're reading, we flash the word death so rapidly, uh, 28 milliseconds, that no one reports seeing it. And it doesn't matter whether we do it in the lab with a questionnaire, whether we do it outside in front of a funeral home, or when we flash the word death, every time what we find is that it has profound effects on one's attitudes and behaviors. So in one of our original studies, we had Christian participants think about death or something unpleasant. And then uh, what we found is that after they thought about death, they liked fellow Christians a lot more and they hated Jewish people. If you go to Israel and you ask Jewish people to think about death, they love Jewish people a lot more, and they hate Christians. If you go to Germany and ask Germans to think about death, they sit closer to fellow Germans and further away from Turkish immigrants. If you go to Iran and you ask Iranians to think about death, they become more supportive of suicide bombers and more willing to become one themselves. If you go to the United States and you ask people to think about dying, they become more supportive of preemptive nuclear, chemical, and biological attacks against countries who pose no direct threat to us. And so the point that I would make, I'm a big fan of George Bernard Shaw. Anybody know Shaw? You know, not that we've seen him lately, but uh, in the play Heartbreak House, uh, Shaw says, when the angel of death sounds his trumpet, the pretenses of civilization are blown from men's heads into the mud like hats in a gust of wind. So we think that one area uh, where these ideas can help us is to understand protracted prejudice and ethnic violence. Another area that we think is very important and very timely is that intimations of mortality also have a radical influence on one's political preferences. I don't know if in the news here there had been anything about the Hitler baby thing. Has that made it over here yet? Or is that just in the US? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, Hitler on everyone's list of not a great guy. How'd Hitler come to power in Germany? That's right, he was elected. 
And this raises the question of how people would elect someone like Hitler. Who's heard of the dead German sociologist Max Weber? Has anybody heard of Weber? In the early part of the 20th century, what Max Weber said is that in times of historical upheaval, uh, we are more likely to embrace a particular kind of leader. Weber called them charismatic leaders, these larger-than-life figures that often declare that God has chosen them to rid the world of evil. And, and, uh, and uh, I had a student who was studying Hitler's rise in Germany, uh, and of course, when Hitler was elected, there were indeed troubled times in Germany. And this got us thinking uh, about the aftermath of the terrible events in the U.S. on September 11, 2001. And I know all of you remember the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Uh, you may also remember uh, that President George W. Bush, um, uh, right before those attacks, he had the lowest approval rating in the history of presidential polling in the U.S. All right, three weeks after the attacks, uh, Bush had the highest approval rating uh, in the history of presidential polling. Uh, now, one possibility, of course, is that the president metamorphosized into a literate and efficient leader and that Americans were responding to this magical transformation uh, into coherence uh, and efficacy. Another possibility uh, is that the events of 9-11 uh, were literally an in-your-face reminder of death. And we did a boatload of studies uh, where we showed that leading up to the 2004 presidential election, that Americans in a benign state of mind were not supportive of President Bush or his policies in Iraq, but if they were reminded of their mortality, then their enthusiasm for the president became profoundly increased. In fact, in one study, five weeks before the 2004 election, uh, we found that in a, con and these were all Americans registered to vote, who intended to vote, uh, in the control condition, uh, they reported that they would be voting for Senator Kerry by a four to one margin. However, when they were reminded of their death beforehand, they said they'd be voting for President Bush by a three to one margin. I, 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 and my point, and I wish we had more time, is this should shock and scare anybody uh, who's a fan of democracy. I don't care where you are on the political spectrum, uh, the fact that a momentary reminder of death can have such radical effects on political preferences uh, should scare us all. A and what's happening in the U.S. Uh, scares me. It should scare you too, by the way, uh, because the same dynamic I is in play. But uh, enough of that, and let's move on a little bit. Uh, let's talk just very briefly about how concerns about mortality, um, it, it, let me say it how it... Oh, it makes us uncomfortable with nature and contemptuous of the environment. John Locke in 1690 in his second treatise on government, he wrote that anything that's natural is of finite duration. And of course, you know that already, right? but anything of finite duration dies. That was the psychological impetus for the creation of the supernatural. And what Becker argued is that when death is on our minds, uh, nature scares us. And uh, from our studies, we know this is true. When people are reminded of their mortality, they vigorously deny that humans are animals. When people are reminded of their mortality, uh, they have more negative attitudes towards animals and are more willing to kill them for reasons other than food or medical research. When people are reminded of their mortality, they become uncomfortable with their bodies and bodily functions. Even things like sex that are ordinarily pleasant are, are radically diminished in terms of people's affection for them under those conditions. When people are reminded of their mortality, they don't find nature beautiful. They prefer pictures of suburban neighborhoods uh, than pristine forests, where under normal conditions, uh, people prefer the forest to the neighborhoods. And we argue that this helps explain 
our cavalier contempt for and disregard of the environment. And of course, we can't talk about cavalier contempt for the environment and disregard of it without talking about humankind's, at least in the West, seemingly insatiable desire uh, for shopping uh, and money. Or Ernest Becker, borrowing a phrase uh, from Soren Kierkegaard, uh, Kierkegaard said that when, at, when we're anxious about death, we tranquilize ourselves with the trivial. And Becker, at the end of the denial of death, he said that modern humans are spending most of their time uh, shopping or drinking, which he said is basically the same thing. Who's ever heard of Tennessee Williams' Cat on a Hot Tin Roof? Do you know that play, anybody? I love when Big Daddy says, uh, the human animal is a beast that dies, and if he's got money, he buys and he buys and he buys, and I think the reason that he buys everything that he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he thinks that one of his purchases uh, will be life everlasting. All right, sure enough, when you remind people of their mortality and you ask them, how much money do you want? They say that they have higher fiscal aspirations. When you remind people of their mortality and you say, how much do you want luxury items like a Mercedes or a Rolex watch? People want fancier stuff. When you remind people of their mortality and you ask them to draw pictures of money, coins and paper money, they literally draw bigger pictures as if money is larger when death is on your mind. And finally, if you give people a stack of money and just ask them to count it, not to keep it, just count the money and give it back, whereas folks in a control condition just count pieces of paper, just counting money reduces death anxiety. If you remind people of their mortality, uh, they watch more television, they eat more cookies, they drink more alcohol, and they smoke more cigarettes, suggesting uh, that our seemingly insatiable desire uh, for money and stuff is at least in part influenced by these existential concerns. All right, one more area, and this is just um, the, in the area of psychopathology. We've done a whole lot of studies uh, where we have shown uh, that existential concerns underlie and or amplify a variety of psychological disorders. And so people who are afraid of spiders, uh, they become more afraid of spiders when they're reminded of death. Obsessive compulsive people reminded of death use more soap and water to wash their hands. Socially anxious people reminded of death hide in a closet to avoid being with other people. Death reminders increase psychological dissociation, which is a known precursor uh, of PTSD. All right, so what? I, I think there's good evidence now, almost irrefutable evidence, that death concerns really do have a profound influence on almost everything that people do, whether we're aware of it or not. And the fact of the matter is, is that we're rarely aware of it. And uh, Thomas Hardy, another dead British novelist, he said, if a way to the better there be, it comes from taking a close look at, at the worst. And so, uh, and we'll end on a better note in, in, in a bit, but um, that this is not an overly uh, flattering depiction uh, of the human animal, because what it seems like, based on this research, is that malignant manifestations of death anxiety bring out the worst in us. And I want to point out that it's not death anxiety per se. All right, death anxiety is not going to go away, although, of course, in its extreme form, it needs to be treated. Uh, but it's not going to go away, nor should it necessarily go away. When death anxiety is a problem is when we bury it under the psychological bushes in the form of repression, and it comes back to bear bitter fruit. All right, nevertheless, you know, at our worst, we're just disillusioned, hateful, warmongering, proto-fascists, plundering the planet in our insatiable quest for dollars and dross and an alcohol, uh, drug, TV, Facebook stupor. Uh, and uh, Robert J. Lifton, a psychohistorian in a book called Destroying the World to Save It, he said, we may have the ignominious distinction of being the first form of life to be directly responsible for our own extinction. 
All right, that's the bad news. All right, the good news, though, is that we have a great track record, that is, human beings, of extricating ourselves from some serious difficulties historically once we're aware uh, of what it is that's producing them. Who remembers, not because we were there, the Middle Ages when plague wiped out half of Europe. Right? And we weren't getting anywhere when we said that it was because of evil spirits, right? but then we discovered that it was bacteria, and that allowed us to discover penicillin, modern medicine, and here we all are today. So my hope is that if we can begin to recognize the pernicious consequences that death anxiety, uh, when we repress it, has on human affairs, then we may be able to deploy our remarkable creativity and intelligence in ways that will enable us to offset this. All right, well, and so here's now let's talk about hospice and palliative care. I know nothing about either, uh, or, but uh, I've watched my wife Maureen and her colleagues uh, do this excellent work that you do every day. I've had the rare privilege, privilege uh, of being able to see uh, what Dr. Balfour Mount, I don't know if that name is mm -hmm. familiar in, in these parts, but he's yeah. the guy I'm told who helped uh, start palliative care and hospice in Canada at, at McGill University and with his colleague Tom Hutchinson They've developed what they've called whole person care. Regardless, I, I don't know uh, that it matters what we call it because in my experiences, I've had the privilege of wandering around and mingling with folks who do the work that you do. Uh, I'm just convinced that hospice work and palliative care is at the vanguard of both medicine and at the vanguard of our humanity. And the reason I say that is because if there's any merit to what I've been saying so far, and I know you know this because you do this every day, uh, death is the ultimate challenge to self-conscious creatures. It literally threatens to tear a gaping hole in the culturally constructed tapestry of meaning that we each rely on uh, in order to stand up every day. Uh, and, uh, and when I see the work that you all do, uh, I call you folks, uh, what do I call you? Bio, social, psychological magicians. Uh, and I, I mean that as the highest praise because I, in my opinion, uh, when I see hospice and palliative care people, uh, what I'm seeing are people using cutting edge evidence-based medical treatments while simultaneously uh, attending to uh, the existential and spiritual concerns that necessarily arise whenever intimations of mortality are, are in the air. All right, and in the book that Tom Hutchinson edited about whole person care, um, he says that, and I've talked at several conferences about these ideas, and then I realized that uh, they're widely known, even if no one's ever heard of this book, because it starts with the assumption uh, that when you're working with terminally ill people, uh, that it's utterly necessary to treat them uh, with respect and unconditional positive regard. And, and we know for a fact that when people are respected, uh, that that encourages them, it uplifts them, uh, and this is manifested in an increased sense of individual dignity. So you have respect leading to a sense of dignity, which makes it possible for terminally ill people and their families to maintain a sense that life has meaning and that they have value even in the most difficult of circumstances. And I guess the way I see it is that what you all are doing at your best is helping people uh, accept life or embrace life uh, without denying death. And I, I think that's a rare feat. And I think what you do is also demonstrably uh, effective. We know, for example, that palliative care and hospice care uh, is quite cost effective relative to obscenely expensive treatments uh, that may extend people's lives for a couple of days. But we also know that in hospice and palliative care settings, that sometimes life is actually extended. Uh, you actually live longer in those settings than you might otherwise, 
Although I'm with Abraham Lincoln who said, in the end, uh, it's not the years in your life that matters, it's the life in your years. I like that one. Have you heard that before? Mm. Uh, Lincoln is the last Republican that I voted for, but that's uh, just, <laughs> just uh, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But anyway, I like that. Uh, and and, and uh, it's also uh, very well known, and there's a lot of good research. Uh, I've, I've been involved with a, a guy named uh, William Breitbart, and he's the head of uh, behavioral medicine at the Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center in Manhattan, and, and he's demonstrated that people in palliative care and hospice settings, uh, that psychological outcomes are much improved, primarily in the form of reduced anxiety uh, and depression. And so, um, what I've been thinking about these days, uh, as I am tottering on the threshold of senility, uh, I keep coming back to what I call a thought experiment. And uh, it's very simple. It's like, well, what would happen if we took what you all do in your work with the people that you serve and extended that to how we interacted with everybody else on the planet? Uh, what would happen, just picture this for a moment, if we treated everyone respectfully, and if that in turn rendered them more dignified, and if that in turn made it easier to believe that life has meaning and that we have value, uh, I'm going to go out on a proverbial limb and argue that life would be better in the world in a matter of minutes. Uh, even if not, well, well, why not try it? It's probably a good idea. All of the world's great religions suggest that we ought to conduct ourselves in that way. All right, well, so the question is, okay, well, how can we do that if we're going to even think about it? And uh, I guess what I would leave you with are two thoughts. Uh, one by Albert Camus. Who knows Camus? I know uh, you're familiar with his work. In his notebooks, he wrote, literally scribbled on the side of one of them, come to, de come to terms with death, thereafter, anything is possible. All right, that may be an overstatement, but certainly a good start. Uh, and so that raises the question, okay, come to terms with death. That's a noble idea, but how are we going to do that? And, and here I rely on the work of Eric Erickson. Anyone know Erickson's work? And very good. Uh, enjoying a resurgence in, in our side of the earth right now, and rightfully so, because what Erickson insists is that if you're going to come to terms with death, you need two things. You need faith and you need courage. And you can't have one without the other. You need faith not in anything in particular except in the goodness and rightness of life. And in order to have faith, uh, you have to have courage. There's just no such thing as faith without courage or courage without faith. And I like how Erickson puts it in the last sentence of his Eight Stages of Man, uh, where he says something along the lines of, when parents have the courage to die, their children will have the faith to live. And I always like ending on that note because I think it puts everything in graphic perspective. And, and, um, and what I tell the Skidmore students is, look, uh, the decisions that you make about how you come to terms with your mortality, and of course this applies to each of us, not only influences the course of your life, but it will in turn influence the course of the lives of the people who come thereafter. And I think it's for that reason that this is of the utmost of importance. All right, I'm going to shut up now, and thank you for listening. I hope this was of some interest, and I, I thank you deeply. I mean this in all sincerity uh, for the work that you do. I literally cannot think of a more important, noble, humane venture uh, than engaging with human beings at the most difficult time in their lives. So thank you very much, and have a good day.